You've seen videos that have likely heightened your interest, anxiety, and fear in understanding end-time Bible prophecies and how they may affect you based on whether you accept that chip in your hand or cattle branding in the forehead or not. There is certainly a lot to unpack about end-time events and how and when they will unfold. What if we could identify the Antichrist and the mark of the beast without even speaking of them? For a moment, let's turn our minds from the fear and absolute dread and terror of these monstrosities and think about the one utmost important question that no one is asking about end time events. The answer will surprise you, yet it solves all the problems surrounding Bible prophecy. If I gave you a dollar bill and asked you to tell me whether it was real or counterfeit, how would you be able to answer the question? Well, yes, you would need to know what a real dollar bill looks and feels like in order to answer the question not the other way around. In the same manner, one would not teach children lies in order for them to learn how to be truthful. The reverse would be the sensible thing to do, wouldn't you agree? If we are honest with ourselves, we might find that most of us have even just a tinge of fear regarding the end time. This could be mainly due to the fact that we do not exactly know all the intricate details of its unfolding. Let's see if we can follow simple human logic here for a bit. By taking the approach that this is a spiritual war and that this fight is between good and evil, then it would be understood that for everything God is and does, there is a counterfeit. If there's an antichrist, then there is a Christ, right? How about the mark of the beast? We are not ignoring the beast, but in this video, we will focus on the mark. If the beast has a mark, then it stands to reason God must have one too. So now the big question is, what is God's mark? How well do we know God? Knowing the genuine could make identifying the counterfeit a much easier feat. In order to understand the concept of a mark or seal, let's take a look at the President's seal. It's familiar, isn't it? The President's seal is a symbol of authority and authenticity, a mark that identifies and validates the individual in question. It's composed of three key elements, the name, the title, and the territory. When we see the president's name emblazoned on the seal, we instantly know who is being represented. The title indicates the role or position that the person holds, and the territory signifies the jurisdiction or area of influence. All three elements come together to form a complete representation of the individual's identity and authority. A seal, in essence, is a mark of identity. It tells us who someone is, what their role is, and the scope of their authority. It's a validation of the person's status and power, a surety that they are who they claim to be. Now let's apply this understanding to a different context. If we consider God as the ultimate authority, wouldn't it make sense for him to have a mark or seal of his own, a mark that identifies him, validates his authority, and outlines his territory. Just as the President's seal identifies and validates him, so does God's mark identify and validate him. It is a mark, a seal that is imprinted on our hearts and minds, a mark of identity that signifies who we are in relation to him. So what is this mark or seal of God? How can we recognize it and what does it mean for us? The answers to these questions lie within the pages of the Bible. To understand what the mark or seal of God is, we must go back to the beginning. Genesis 1 verse 1 reads, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. This opening single verse gives us three crucial pieces of information. God's name, his title, and his territory. God may be referred to by other names, but for the purpose of this video, firstly, God's name is God. It may seem simple, but it's a name that carries enormous weight and significance. It is a name that is synonymous with the Creator, the Supreme Being, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Secondly, his title. God is not just a name, but also a role. In Genesis, he is identified as the Creator. This title signifies his power, his authority, his dominion, and his ability to bring life from nothingness. Lastly, his territory is explicitly stated as the heavens and the earth. It's a broad term, but it encompasses everything from the furthest reaches of space to the smallest grain of sand on a beach. It's a territory that is infinite and all-encompassing, just like God himself. In Genesis, after God saw that his creation was good, the story rounds out with God resting from all his work. We see in Exodus 28, 11, where God issues the commandment to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. In these verses, God reminds us that he created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. 
This is a reiteration of his name, the Lord thy God, his title, creator and his territory, heaven and earth. It's an echo of Genesis 1, 1, reinforcing the same three key elements. The fourth commandment of all ten uniquely bears both the name and title of the lawgiver, signifying the authority behind the law. This makes it the seal of God, confirming the authenticity and binding nature of his law. The Sabbath is more than just a day of rest. The act of resting on the seventh day is a mark of God's authority as the Creator. But why is this important? By observing the Sabbath, we acknowledge His Lordship, we accept His mark, we align ourselves with God and recognize Him as our Creator, Lord of the heavens and the earth, and we submit to His rule over our lives. It's a mark, a seal, if you will, of our loyalty and allegiance to God. This matters to God as He explicitly commanded us to remember it. It's a powerful statement, one that shapes our identity and helps to determine our destiny. In the midst of this peeling away of layers, it is only fair to introduce other sources of information. A section from a catechism by Peter Guyman, The Convert's Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, St. Louis B. Herder Book Company, 1957 edition, page 50, which is written in a question and answer format, goes as follows. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Another statement from a catechism by Stephen Keenan, a doctrinal catechism, New York, P.J. Kennedy and Sons, 3rd American edition, revised edition, page 174 says, Question, have you any other way of proving that the Church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer, had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Clear power and authority have been declared in the response regarding this mark or seal. This information is not an attempt to point fingers at anyone in particular. It is merely to direct the curious to available literature for their own observance, if interested. In essence, logical reasoning dictates that there are only two classifications of systems that identify as Christian, the commandment-keeping system and the Roman Catholic system. Each bears its mark of authority. Now let's turn to Exodus 31, 13. Say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come, so you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. Here, God himself is stating what his seal is, the observance of his Sabbaths, making it clear that this is not just about a day of rest, it's about recognizing and acknowledging God as our creator, the one who makes us holy. But what does it mean to have this seal? It's not a physical mark to further understand this. Revelation 7, 2, 3 gives us a clue. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. In this context, the hand and the forehead represent two crucial aspects of our lives. The hand symbolizes our actions, what we do. The forehead represents our beliefs, our thoughts, our faith. So when we talk about the seal of God, we're talking about God's commandments being so ingrained in us that they govern our actions and beliefs. This seal is not just about who God is, the creator of heaven and earth. It's about us too. It's about how we choose to live our lives, how we honor God, how we observe his Sabbaths. It's about recognizing his authority and his role as our creator. It's about living in a way that pleases him, how we treat others and how we honor God, following his commandments, not out of obligation, but out of love and respect for him. Revelation 22, four speaks of God's people seeing his face and his name being on their foreheads. Revelation 3.12 echoes the same sentiment. Those who overcome are marked with the name of God, the name of the city of God and the new name of Jesus. This is a metaphor for identity. The seal of God is about who we are in, in relation to him. It's about accepting his authority, living under his rule and being part of his kingdom. In Revelation 14, 1, we see the Lamb, Jesus Christ, standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. This is a picture of allegiance, of loyalty, of commitment to God and his ways. This is indeed a war of worship, just like in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar when the allegiances of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and even Daniel were tested. 
There will be a day when our allegiance will also be tested. While we gather our thoughts, let's take a look at one verse from Matthew chapter 5, spoken by Jesus. Verse 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Will you choose to receive the mark of our Creator God?